on today we turn to chapter 13 of the gospel of mark and we begin to hear jesus teach about the end times the end times and i'm going to begin at verse 1 of chapter 13 if you don't have your bible it's on the screen i'm going to read down to verse 6 and then i'm going to jump down to verse 32 to 37. I believe uh, God is going to encourage us, but also uh, challenge us as we read this text. It says, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And Jesus replied, do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another everyone will be thrown down as jesus was sitting on the mount of olives opposite the temple peter james john and andrew asked him privately tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are all to be fulfilled jesus said to them watch out that no one deceives you many will come in my name claiming i am he and will deceive many Verse 32, but no one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels nor the son, but only the father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task and tells the one at the door, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you don't know when the owner of the house will come back. Whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn, if he comes suddenly, don't let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. You may take your seats. As you go to your seats, Look at your neighbor and tell them, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. While the original author of this quote is unknown, its influence has spread both far and wide. From musicians to entertainers to philosophers, many have used this phrase for their personal motivation. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Church, I am not a morning person. Any, any people in the house who are not morning people, amen, you can, you can go ahead and tell the truth. I, I'm not a morning person. I would much rather work late into the night and then sleep in in the morning. But, but there are parts of my role as a, as a father, as a husband, as a pastor that, that require me to wake up early some mornings. And this is what I've discovered, this simple truth that I know many of you have also discovered. This is it. It's much easier to be ready in the morning when you get ready at night. <laughs> when, 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 when the clothes are already ironed and the lunch is already packed and, and the bag is already prepared and the gas tank is full and the shower is taken, then I can just get up and go in the morning. The morning is way more manageable. But when all those things are on my morning to-do list, when I know I got I to gotta pack the bag, I got to go downstairs, I got to go get gas, I got to go do all these things, I already know it's going to be a rough day. But if I stay ready, I don't have to get ready. Even fictional characters like, like Superman, they understood this principle. You see, because while other superheroes had to go to the Batcave or they had to go somewhere else to get their stuff to get ready, Superman just had his stuff on up under his shirt. All he had to do was take the shirt off because everything he had was already underneath. You see, Batman, Batman was going to the Batcave and, and other folks were trying to go get their stuff. But Superman knew a situation might arise where I got to be ready right where I am. I might not be able to go home, so let me just stay ready. This, this principle can revolutionize our lives because so many opportunities are missed because we're not ready to walk through the door when the opportunity is available. Somebody ought to say amen. 
if we if we real honest in the house we can say you know what I don't know about y'all I can say I missed some opportunities because I was not ready when the door was open the door was wide open but I, I wasn't ready you know how we do we say well let me think about it or let me get my resume together or let me call so and so see if I'm ready for that and and God wants you and I to know that if we stay ready we won't have to get ready when when opportunity knocks will already be prepared in one of my favorite books the seven habits of highly effective people Stephen Covey he argues that all seven habits are really built upon the first habit the first habit is this be proactive the first habit is essentially saying if you think ahead and you stay ready, you're going to be more productive in your life. Don't let life just happen to you, but be prepared to make life respect your game plan. We, we cannot go through life just allowing it to happen to us and say, well, I'm going to get ready for next week when next week comes. We have to be prepared for what may be coming before us. I was at a meeting recently where there were some contractors who were vying for a job opportunity and, and they made the decision very easy for us because some came prepared and some did not. Some thought the only question they're going to ask is how much are we going to charge, but others knew we got to have more details to our plan. And so there were some questions we asked and some said, well, that's a good question. We're going to get back to you next week. But there was one person who said, you know what, I thought you might ask that question. So if you turn in your, in your portfolio to page nine, I already put it in there for you. You see, they came ready, so they didn't have to say we're going to call you back or, or we'll let you know in the future. But they said, if I stay ready, I don't got to get ready. Now, this principle connects to our faith journey because every day you and I must battle between the flesh and the spirit. Every day we have to fend off the attack of the enemy. Don't get it twisted. Don't be confused because things are going well in your life. But every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every day of the week, there's going to be a battle between your flesh and your spirit. But watch this. If you stay ready, you don't always have to get ready. You, if you begin your, word, your day in the Word, if I begin my day in prayer, if I begin my day in meditation, what I'm doing is I'm staying ready so that when the enemy comes in like a flood, I already got the standard. I already got the banner that says God has given me all that I need to overcome. I'm already right in my mind to say, you know what? I knew you were going to try to get me off track this week. But I'm not caught by surprise. See, that, that's what happens in, in oftentimes modern-day warfare. There's a tactic called guerrilla warfare where the enemy can come at you from every different direction. But when you are prepared, you won't be surprised. So if we make up in our minds that we are going to stay ready, then we won't have to get ready. As we turn to the text today, Jesus is teaching his disciples about the end times. And they ask him, Jesus, when is all this going to go down? When is all this going to happen? What's going to be the sign of the times? And Jesus says, nobody knows. Nobody knows when it's all going to go down. Don't, nobody, don't let anybody tell you they know, right? Folk come, they, folk come up with dates all the time. This is when the world going to end. But if you read your Bible, Jesus says very clearly, Mark 13, verse 32, nobody knows. Jesus says, nobody knows when it's going to go down, but he says, look, if you stay ready, <laughs> you don't got to worry. You don't got to get ready. And as you and I live in this world, we must remind ourselves consistently that we were never meant to be here forever. That the God of the universe has placed us here. He's called us to execute his plan, and then he is coming back to get us. Now, we, we can always run the risk of being so heavenly minded that we're not any earthly good, but we must understand that, that in order to benefit this world the most, we've got to understand that our allegiance is primarily to the God of heaven. He's the one that orders our steps, that gives us direction, and so... In order to make it through difficult times in this world, we must always remember this is not our final destination. If you were moving in somewhere, you were going to live somewhere for about six months, you were, you were going there for six months, you wouldn't go and buy everything uh, possible and fill it up in that apartment. You wouldn't put everything in there because you know why? You say, I'm not going to be here forever. 
And so neither should you or I begin to live and act like this is our final destination. God has a greater purpose for this world and for our lives. And so when he cracks the sky, when he comes back to get those who he has called, will we be ready? The question for you and I is how do we stay ready for God's greater purposes? The first thing this, this Bible passage teaches us that, that God has, has, has encouraged me to highlight is this. Number one, don't become enamored with the things of this world. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't get caught up. <laughs> to, to, be, to be enamored means to be infatuated with or, or enchanted by. And, and Jesus is teaching us not to get too caught up in the things of this world. Look at what happens. As Jesus and his disciples are leaving the temple, one of his disciples, he looks up at the temple and he says, oh, Jesus. This building is so beautiful. Look at the stones. Look, look at how intricate it is, Jesus. This is awesome. And Jesus says, yeah, it looks good. But it's all going to fall apart. He says, every stone here is going to fall down. Now, what he's initially doing here, church, is he is prophesying about the destruction of the temple, which actually happened in 70 AD, 40 years after he died. Exactly what he said took place. But he's also saying, don't get too closely linked to material things in this world because they will all fall apart. If you focus too much on the external, you might not see that inwardly it's empty. And before you know it, you will be grasping at something that cannot sustain you. I wish I had a witness in here who, who can just think back over their life, their life and say, you know what, yeah, I've been there, Pastor, where, where I worked hard for that thing, or I worked hard to acquire that, and I put all my energy and my effort into it because I thought it was going to do something for me. I thought it was going to fulfill me or complete me, but once I got my hands on it, I realized it still left me empty. Anybody ever honest enough to say, I had that experience, Pastor? I, I went through that. I tried to run after that thing or that person. And when I finally got it, I realized it didn't satisfy me anyway. Jesus is saying, do not get caught up in the things of this world. I, I, read, I read a quote by an Australian businessman, and, and he, had, he had just made a $50 million donation to charity. Lord have mercy. Woo! It still, it blows my mind that some folk got $50 million to give away, right? Because if he, if he gave away $50 million, that means he probably had 10 times that, right? At least. He gave away $50 million. But, but he, he gave this quote in an interview, and it was powerful. He said, I suppose I could have bought myself a yacht, or I could have spent it on extravagant vacations, or maybe bought a half a dozen houses. But then he said this. He said, but then how could I sit in my church every Sunday? Now, this is, this is what he was saying. Don't miss this. He was saying, my faith reminds me not to get too connected to material things. And so I don't want to be in a position where I get so connected to material things that I miss out on who God is calling me to be. Now, don't get me wrong. God, God doesn't mind you and I having some nice things. Amen? If, if you are being a, a faithful steward over what God has given you, go ahead and buy that car. Go, go ahead and buy that house if you're being faithful. But here's the question. Here's always the question. The question is this. Does that car have me or do I have it? Does that house have me or do I have it? There are, can I be real honest? There are some things, y'all, that I have, my wife and I have the money in the bank to buy, but God said, Brian, don't buy it. Now, you cannot buy it because if you buy it, it will have you and you won't have it. Uh, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. That, that, that's what the Lord spoke. I don't know what he's speaking in your life. That's what he spoke to my life. He said, there are some things that we can afford financially, but we cannot afford them spiritually. Because when we go after them, what happens financially, we can make the payment. But spiritually, it begins to make us prideful. It begins to make us think it's about us. And then we turn away from God and turn into ourselves and think we're the ones who have got us to where we are. Jesus says, don't get caught up. 
don't get caught up in all this material stuff because it's all going to fall down. It's all going to fall apart. Here, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. The question is whether or not I have the thing or the things has me. If you are counting how many compliments you got because of it, it has you. <laughs> if, if, if you are ready to fight when somebody messes it up, it has you. Y'all, y'all ain't saying that to me in here. And so, and so God says, you got to make sure you don't become enamored with the things of this world. You got to realize that the purpose God has for me is greater than these things. Jesus said, be careful that you don't get caught up in all these things, number one. Secondly, in the text, he says, be careful that you don't become or you don't get deceived by the people of this world. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be deceived. deceived. Look look at what happens here. Jesus, he continues teaching his disciples, and, and he says, watch out that nobody deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am the one. Y'all, we only have to look at recent history for a moment to to find out people like David Koresh, like like Jim Jones, who said, I am the one. Now, for the young folk in the house, I'm not talking about Jim Jones, the rapper. I'm talking about Jim Jones. The the brother who said he was the Messiah. Just make that distinction for y'all. Right, right. We got folks like that who said, I'm, I'm the Messiah. And Jesus said, don't be confused. When I come back, there will be no doubt. When I come back, he said, I'm going to come in on the clouds. There's not going to be a doubt that it's me when I come. But yet and still, people go running after these false messiahs. And Jesus says, don't let people deceive you. Now, now, we got to apply this even further to our lives because I believe if we're going to, to fulfill and experience God's greater purpose for our life, we must make sure that people in this world don't deceive us on a number of levels. You see, because everybody's not on your team. I'm, I'm, I, I, I got I to just make it real plain to, to us in the house. Everybody's not on your team. Look, when we watch, when we watch sports on, on television, it's very interesting that, that modern-day sports, everybody on the same team wears the same colors, right? They all wear the same uniform so that during the game, nobody will make a mistake or nobody will make a, a do purposefully a pass to the wrong person. Right? Now, some of y'all watched the football game last week. You saw that Ben, Big, Big Ben, he, he threw a couple interceptions. Right? But he didn't do it on purpose. Right? Because the other person on the other team had a different jersey on. He wasn't trying to throw it to him. He made that mistake. Right? But here's the issue for those of us who are Christians living in this world. Outwardly, we don't have on uniforms. Outwardly, it's hard to figure out sometimes who's on your team. I wish I had a couple witnesses in here because everybody talking about Jesus is not living for Jesus. Everybody closing their eyes is not praying. Everybody don't come to church for the same reason. Some come to P-R-A-Y and some come to P-R-E-Y. So everybody not on your team. And so Jesus says, he says to his disciples, don't don't get caught up, y'all. He says, make sure you keep your eyes open because everybody's not on your team. We we tell our our children or we we read our children the, the classic tale of Little Red Riding Hood. But there's a message in there for us. There's a message in there for the adults. Some people are out to deceive you and not everybody's on your team. You got to learn how to pray. I got to learn how to pray every day when I wake up. Lord, help me discern the spirits that I'm going to encounter today. Because people will smile up in your face all the while. They want to take your place. Right? So I got to learn. I got to learn how to discern the spirits that at work, at, at my job, at, at my home, uh, in, in, in when, I'm, when I'm out in the city, wherever, I got to learn. God, help me discern what's going on here. 
are, are they really on my team? And I believe that if you are saved, if you have the Holy Spirit, the Lord God will help you to discern who's with you and who's against you. This, this is why we preach and teach about having accountability in your life. Why? Because sometimes your godly friends can discern what you can't. Mm. I, I should have got, got a few more claps on that one, man, you know. Sometimes your, your godly friends can discern what you can. You can't, we can't be out here trying to do this thing by ourselves because we will get deceived. But when I got somebody on my left and on my right who loves God and who loves me, sometimes they're going to see something and say, you know what, something not right about her. You ever heard somebody say, something not right about him? And you, you may have brushed it off, right? But God is saying, that's why you need accountability, because they can discern some things you might not be able to. Can, can, I, can, I, can, I talk, can I talk to the single folks for a minute? That's why you just can't be out here dating folk and not let nobody know who you dating. I know y'all ain't gonna feel me on this thing right here. You say, Pastor, I'ma date who I wanna date, and I'm a, I want, I'm private. No, you need somebody to know what's going on in your life. Because watch this, by the time, by the time you finally, finally you bring them around the family, or you bring them around somebody you know, and that person wanna tell you the truth, but now you engaged. They, they, they ain't nobody met them until you got a ring on your finger, and now they don't want to tell you the truth because they don't want to hurt your feelings or lose your relationship, but you needed some accountability in your life because they would have told you from the start something not right about him. They would have told you off top, that ain't the one. Ah, uh, now, 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 and now when they tell you the truth, you say, well, stop hating on me. I know you mad. You, they hating. But it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have come across like that had you received it on week one. When they said, yeah, I saw him with her, or I, I know this. Ex move on, pastor, move on. Move on. Jesus says, don't be deceived. And the way, the way I avoid deception is by knowing the Word of God and being surrounded by people who love God and know His Word. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. And the more, the more I isolate myself, the more I set myself up for deception. Jesus he says clearly to his disciples, if you're going to stay ready, number one, he says, make sure that you don't become enamored with the things of this world. Number two, don't be deceived by the people of this world. And thirdly and finally, he says, don't fall asleep on your assignment. Tap your neighbor and say, wake up. Say, wake up. <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, don't fall asleep on your assignment. Listen, y'all, Jesus says, it was like a man who went away on a journey, put his servants in charge, and he says, he says, you don't know when the owner of the house is going to come back. When my brother and I, we, we had gotten to our, our later years in high school. My brother is a couple years older than me. Uh, we got to our later years in high school, and my, my parents, by that point, they were comfortable to leave us at home by ourselves for a couple days. Amen. They, they were comfortable enough to leave us at home, and, and, and they would always tell us when they were coming back. So if they said, we're going to be back on Sunday, we'd make sure everything was right on Sunday. If they said, you got to make sure you vacuum the carpets, we vacuum the carpet on Sunday. Say, make sure you mow the lawn, we mow the lawn on Sunday. Make sure you do dishes, we do dishes on Sunday. Why? Because we had a specific time when we knew they were going to be back so we could set our whole strategy up to make sure everything was right and we was at the door smiling when they came back on Sunday because we knew. But guess what, y'all? One time, they didn't come back on Sunday. Now, now, praise God, they called. 
And they said, we coming back early. We on our way. We'll be there in 45 minutes. And you know what we said? We said, oh, shoot, grab the vacuum. Grab the lawnmower. Do the dishes. What you doing? <laughs> we, said, we said, we got to get everything done in 45 minutes because we thought we had more time. Here's the issue. Jesus says, the owner of the house is not going to call. He's not going to tell you, I'm coming back on Tuesday at 3 o'clock. He says, therefore, you have to be ready. The struggle is that we, we sometimes feel like in this life we have infinite time. We feel like the master is, is going to give us a forewarning or he's not, he's not even going to call. Uh, he's not going to come back without calling. But he says, don't put off your assignment until he's already here. You see, if we stay ready, we won't have to get ready. In the year 2009, uh, television show that was popular, still on today, called American uh, Idol. Uh, it was won by a young man named Chris Allen. And Chris Allen uh, had a, uh, an album he released shortly after he won this American Idol. And he, the first song he released was called Live Like We're Dying. Powerful song. In this song, he talked about making sure we take account or we take seriously every moment of our lives. He was saying that essentially there's only a certain amount of time that we have and, and we don't know when it's going to end. So we've got to live this life like we're dying. You see, when Christ comes back, he, he won't just be asking, did you go to church or did you pay a tithe or, 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 or did you guess right about when I was going to come back? He wants to know, were you doing the assignment that I left for you? Did you fulfill your purpose? Did you walk into your destiny or were you sleeping? Who were you supposed to pray for? Who were you supposed to mentor? Who were you supposed to lead to Christ? Don't you know that for many of us, God has assigned a person that we are supposed to lead to the Lord? Who were you supposed to lead to Christ? Who were you supposed to, to serve in ministry with? What gifts did he put inside of you that you are supposed to be using? He says, when I come back, will I find you at your post? Or will I have to say, wake up? Will he have to come and say, wake up? I want to I close this, this message with, with the scripture from, from the Apostle Paul. Paul is, is writing what many believe to be the final letter he ever wrote. He's writing to encourage a young man named Timothy who is going to be leading in the Christian movement. And so he's, he's excited about what Timothy is going to do, but, but he wants Timothy to be prepared. And at the end of his letter, Paul says this. The time for my departure is near. He says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and I've kept the faith. Then he says, therefore, there is now stored up for me the crown of righteousness. He said, I'm not even thinking. He said, I'm not worried about it. I'm not confused. He said, I know the crown is waiting for me. And not just for me, but for everybody else who wanted to see the Lord. He said, I know the crown is waiting for me. Now listen, y'all. Paul knows that his journey is almost over. But he doesn't say, let me get ready. He doesn't say, let me try to get some other things in order. He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And I kept the faith. You see, what he's saying is, I don't have to get ready because I stayed ready. He said, I did what God called me to do. I, I, I didn't let folk deceive me. I didn't get caught up in the things of this world and I didn't fall asleep on my assignment. God says to you and I, that we have a purpose, assignments that he wants us to accomplish, some in this season and some even larger for a greater purpose. And he's asking us, do we know what our assignment is? Do you know what your assignment is in this season? 
Do you know what your assignment is for the greater good and the greater glory of God? Do you know, he says, for when we know what our assignments are, we can walk in our purpose. And instead of getting ready, we can just wait to hear the Lord say, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over few things, but I'm going to put you in charge of so much more. If we stay ready, we won't have to get ready. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for your power in our lives that gives us strength and courage to walk in your calling. We thank you, Lord God, for meeting us in some of the most difficult moments of decision. We pray, Lord God, that we would listen clearly for your voice, that we would hear what you're calling us to, so that when you come back, we won't be sleeping on our assignment. Help us, oh God, to stay ready for your greater purpose. In Jesus' name, amen.